Hi, everyone. Welcome to the latest installment of our ongoing editorial webinar series, Coffee Talk. Each hour-long, information-packed episode features the observations and insights of an independent expert on a wide range of tech industry topics. Many thanks to the underwriting sponsor of this episode, Red Canary, a pioneer of managed detection and response, securing your endpoints cloud, and whatever comes next. Without their support, this series would not be possible. And thanks to you for joining us. I'm John K. Waters, editor and chief of the Converge 360 Group of 1105 Media, and I'll be your moderator. Today's topic is digital transformation and enterprise security by managed detection response is the future. And our lead presenter is technologist, creator of compelling content, and senior resultant, Howard M. Cohen. Before we get started, though, let's uh, do just a bit of housekeeping. This episode is being recorded for later access. Keep an eye out for, a li uh, for an email with a link to that recording. It will be coming your way in the next few days. Uh, we'll make some time during the talk for some questions. Please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. We'll do our very, very best to get to all of them. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see some extra resources provided by our sponsor. Be sure to check those out. And as a small thank you to the first 200 attendees who stick with us to the end, we will be sending you a $5 gift certificate to Starbucks. It's a cup of joe to go with the info. Uh, now let me introduce our first presenter. In his 40-plus years in the IT industry, Howard M. Cohen has held senior executive positions in many of the top channel partner organizations, and he currently writes for mm. and about IT and the IT channel. Howard is a sought-after speaker, an insightful observer of the technology landscape, and one of our favorite presenters. Take it away, Howard. Thank you very much, John. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome. Uh, those of you who have ever attended any of my presentations in the past know that as a writer, I can't help myself, I'm, I'm a word guy. And I like to start every presentation with a word of the day. Today's word is one of my personal favorites. It's a word, focus. Focus. Uh, and anybody who works in IT knows focus is one of the hardest things to achieve in our lives because we're constantly being called upon to put out fires all around us. We all wear that fireman's cap, and we would love to get rid of it. Um, well, since focus has always been a dream of mine, I thought it would be a great thing to share today as the reason why um, as we move through more and more digital transformations, managed detection and response is going to have to become the way in which we secure all of our technology. Okay, so what do I mean about focus? Well, what kind of business are you? What is your business? Are you a healthcare organization? Perhaps a doctor's office, a dentist's office, perhaps um, some other kind of medical practice, a specialty, what have you? Okay, that's what you do. Perhaps you're a law firm or one of the many different companies that support and supply law firms with various resources. Um, you're in the legal market. Uh, okay, that's what you do. Perhaps you're in the, con you're in the building trade. Uh, you're an architect, let's say. Or maybe you're a general contractor or a builder or a craftsman or even a real estate developer. Those are all contributors to the building trade, and they're all various different kinds of businesses. Similarly, there are many different kinds of businesses that process food for us. You have meat packers, you have bakers, you have all kinds of companies that you know, put food together, package it, and get it into our hands so that we can eat it. Now, of course, if you're having food, you should serve that food and food service, restaurants, that's another big business with many different companies in it, as is entertainment. All kinds of organizations are involved in the entertainment industry. The transportation industry is also very diverse. We have, you know, we have um, companies that transport people, companies that transport merchandise, and of course, those companies that transport merchandise are most important to companies in manufacturing to get their products from the factory to a waiting public market. Okay, so you may be in any of these businesses or others. 
My question to you is, when you first went into this business, did you ever expect that you'd also have to go into the technology business? So way back when you went into whatever business you're in, you found that you needed to build a computer network. You needed to probably have a network closet or maybe a data center or somewhere in between. You needed to put in a whole bunch of cabling and, and equipment, servers, storage, power conditioning, all kinds of things and hire a whole bunch of people who have nothing to do with what you do for a living. But you needed to hire them, even though you had no idea what skills to look for. You went out and you hired them, and, and they're not cheap. So here you are. You're in the technology business inadvertently when you really want to focus on what you do. A couple of years ago, we got some good news, news that helped us to, well, doing all of this helped us lose our focus, right? Okay, so we lost our focus. A few years ago, we had the opportunity to get it back. And we did that, first and foremost, by taking all of this and sending it on into the cloud. Now, let's, let's demystify the cloud, right? The cloud is not some odd ephemeral thing that nobody knows the nature. It's a data center. The cloud is con consists of data centers each one delivering different services. So what we really did was got rid of the equipment and the software and the cabling, well, not the cabling, we kept that, but the hardware and the software got rid of it and we're using somebody else's now. So they run the hardware and they maintain it and they power it and they cool it and they, they encumber all the expense and we simply pay a monthly fee to share that infrastructure with other companies. So this, gets us out of the computer business. All we do is use the computers. So if anybody ever tries to ask you why, why did you get rid of all your computer equipment? Why did you get rid of all your software? It was so pretty, all those flashing lights. No, seriously. <laughs> if they ask you why you got rid of all that and moved it all to the cloud, the simple answer is, Network management is not what you do for a living. Just that simple. And quite frankly, that's the reason that everybody moved to the cloud. Because network management was not what they did for a living, and they didn't want to do it anymore. Now, all they have to do is use the, 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 the technology that is being managed for them by cloud providers. What happened? We got our focus back. Now we can focus on our business and do what we really came there to do. And this is great. This is great. Many businesses talk about how different it has been, uh, how much more, more wonderful it's been since they moved to the cloud. And you'll notice that most people have moved from infrastructure, I'm sorry, from platform as a service where they develop software in the cloud to infrastructure as a service where they simply use the cloud to run their servers and their storage, to software as a service where they don't run anything. They just use the software. We're getting further and further from computer operations and closer and closer to simply being users. And that's all good. However, no sooner did we get to the point where we could focus once again then people came along and said, hey, listen, listen, if you want to remain competitive, you know, and if you, you're going to have to change with the times because everybody else is doing it. You're going to have to consider getting yourself a digital transformation. Oh, man, digital transformation. It sounds so huge, right? It sounds so powerful. Let's have a digital transformation. Okay, that's great. And you know, a lot of people have defined digital transformation. Hey, Howard, yeah. your uh, your mic has uh, has shifted. Okay. Stand by, please. Is that better? Yep, that's it. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so the question.
question we all need to ask ourselves is, what exactly is a digital Actually, Howard, your mic is not there yet. It's still, uh, you sound like you're down a long hallway. Sorry about this, folks. As uh, Howard uh, uh, deals with these technical issues, be sure uh, that you, if you have a question, be sure that you enter it into the Q&A box. Uh, we really want your feedback, and we want to respond to your specific uh, interests. H Howard, are you with us again? Yeah, does that sound better? There you go. Now you got it, and I will sign off. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, so... What is digital transformation? I actually did a survey of hundreds of publications, and I came up with hundreds of definitions of digital transformation. There were some similarities, but a lot of them took it off in the wrong direction. Let me show you what I mean. Many of them said that a digital transformation looks like this, where you're replacing all of your existing equipment with new equipment. And, well, that's not a digital transformation. The fact of the matter is, if you've moved to the cloud, you don't have all that much equipment that you need to replace. So, no, this is not a digital transformation. But it, it, and by the way, these days the boxes are smaller, so that's a good thing. Uh, but these days, this is called an upgrade. An upgrade. We're upgrading our equipment and therefore... Um, not a digital transformation. Now, not a digital transformation. Looking at the people side of the equation, some people think that it's, well, I don't think anybody thinks it's that. Uh, it's not a, uh, it doesn't go big and green, but I thought it was fun to share. So let's really focus down on what a digital transformation really ends up being when you look at the ones that we've talked about over the years. Digital transformation. Digital transformation is not, not really about technology, not directly about technology, as much as it is about people and how we can apply technology, how we use technology to help them do what they do better, faster, with fewer errors and more enjoyably. Um, you know, this is one of the big ways in which we've been able to improve the employee experience. And of course, the only way to improve a customer experience is to improve the employee experience because they are what interfaces with the customer. So digital transformation is really how we apply technology to take care of the simple repetitive tasks, what, lo what, what lots of people like to call the scut work, if you will, so that people Ready? You ready? People are free to focus on more valuable, productive work, more satisfying work. That's why focus is our word of the day today. So a little more about the nature of um, the nature of uh, digital transformations. Digital transformation almost always requires either let's be very specific about this, requires either the new application or a new approach to applying technology that you already own, or you may decide to add new technology to create this digital transformation. You know, you talk about artificial intelligence. I think we're going to go through a lot of digital transformations inspired by and using new artificial intelligence products. And I, I think that's been happening for a long time now. As new software is introduced, it gives us new capabilities. We apply those to our business and we really have a digital transformation because people are now able to perform better than they ever have before using the technology as their tools. So digital transformation requires new approaches to technology and new technology. And one of the biggest mistakes people make, and they make it all the time, is when you do change technologies, even when you do an upgrade, 
but especially when you're change, you know, adding new technology, you have to take another look at your security because what you're doing today may not protect, may not adequately protect what you're putting into your environment. You, know, you need to look at the security required for any new addition. And so just about every digital transformation requires new technologies that require a new approach to security. Okay, let, let's put that in the context now of our ability to focus and okay, all we have to do is improve our security. That sounds so easy. It's not easy. And here's why it's not easy. You've all heard of the ISO. You've heard of ISO 27,000, ISO 9,000, all these different regulatory compliance tests that you must pass to qualify to be declared compliant with specific regulations. The ISO is pretty much responsible for all of them. And it is the International Organization for Standardization. I know that that spells out IOS for those of you who are worried about that. But this is kind of like NATO, which in the language it was originally described in spells out OTAN, which is NATO backwards, but that's not germane. Okay, so the ISO has very cleverly flipped its initials around and created the OSI. This is a long, long time ago. The ISO OSI, the Open Systems Interconnect Model, many of you may have heard of it referred to as the seven layer model, the seven layer model. And that's what it looks like. It is indeed a seven layer model that describes every step along the path of a network. So you start with the physical layer. What is that? Basically, it's the cables in the wall. You know, those of you who've ever asked this question of an IT engineer, if you ask them, what is the network? They'll tell you it's the cables. That's the actual network. And then you add to that the frequencies that are used by Wi-Fi and 5G and other ways of, 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 of moving data from one place to another. But that's the physical layer. We need to connect to that physical layer using some kind of network interface. In PCs, it was a network interface card. Every mobile device, every laptop, every tablet, every phone, they all have a network interface. Some of them are Bluetooth, some of them are Wi-Fi, some of them are cable connect, and that's odd these days. But the data link connects us to the physical cable, and that connects us to the network. So now we're connected and we are connected to the network and there are protocols for being connected to the network that control how that all works and what is it meant to do? The network is meant to transport data from one place to another. I like to say that data only makes money when it's in motion. So we want to move the data from one place to another, from a bank to a bank customer, as an example. Um, from a publication to its readers. We want to transport data across the network. Uh, we're transporting data across the network right now. Uh, my speech and the slides, it's, it's all being transported across the internet. When users decide to start using that data and want to connect with that data, they establish their own session on the network. They log in. So you're all connecting to the session layer every day when you log into your computer. The easy way for you to get to that is through the presentation layer, which for most of us is Windows. For some of us, it's iOS or it's Linux or it's Chrome. But the presentation layer is what gives us access to our session. And then on top of the presentation layer, finally, we run the application layer, which is the software that does stuff for us. Okay, so we've now traveled up the seven layer model. And then once we're there, we travel back down the seven layer model and up and down and back and forth. And that's how the model works. Fantastic. Most every time I present this, somebody invariably asks, where is the security layer? I don't see the security layer. And that's a really good question. 
It's a really good question. Now, I'll, I point out to them that beneath the physical layer, there's really a power layer because without power, we can't do any of this. And many people have pointed out to me that above the application layer, there is a political layer where we decide what software, whose software we're going to use, what we're going to support, and so forth. So there are unnamed layers there, but the security layer is very different. The security layer, well, if you ask me right now, where is the security layer? My answer would be yes. Sounds persnickety, but it's not. Because security has to be applied at every layer. Each layer must have its own focused, dedicated security. You know, at the physical layer, you want to make sure that people can't get at your cabling, they can't get break into your Wi-Fi. Um, at the network layer, again, same thing, transport. You want to make sure that nobody is listening in to the data and grabbing it off the wire as you're, as you're tra transporting across it. You don't want people being able to glom on to your user's sessions. And how do they do that? Through stolen credentials. And then at the application layer, you want to use hardened applications because that's what contributes to better security at every layer. This also suggests to us that there are a lot of reasons why, you know what, we have to answer no to the question, is all this something you want to do yourself? Okay, beyond the obvious, this is a lot of work. This is a lot of different kinds of expertise when you talk about security at every layer. Most companies don't have people on staff who can do this, all of this. And they use software to supplement that, but it's usually not enough. So no, this is not something you want to do yourself. Complicating this is what I like to refer to as the 4 million. One of the first challenges and one of the first limitations to those challenges. The 4 million. A couple of years ago, I probably would have said the 2.5 million. A couple of years from now, I hope I don't have to say the 6 million. But what it refers to is the number of open job requisitions that are out there in the world for cybersecurity and other technology careers. Four, over four million open recs for technology jobs that need to be filled and they can't. They can't find people to fill them. They can't find skilled, capable people to fill them. Um, 800,000 of those jobs are right here in the good old USA. So we are confronting a shortage of people, even though we have the jobs to employ them in. And this, is, this skills gap that I'm talking about, has it's not new. This has been going on for years, and we expect it's going to continue to go on for years. Lots of changes are happening, but it's going to take a while for those changes to take effect. So we can expect for the near term, for the foreseeable future, we're going to have a hard time finding people. And if we do find them, since they're so scarce, what happens with things that are scarce? They get more expensive. They get more precious. And so we're going to spend a lot more on the people we do find. Uh, and that's prohibitive for a lot of companies. Another problem is the people that we do have, they're becoming completely overwhelmed. They need help. Those open job recs are open for a reason because the people that are there are being, you know, they, they, the demands on them are ridiculous. They can't keep up with all the different people and all the different problems that they're encountering. So they end up like this young woman and eventually she's going to get burned out and she's going to decide I've got to go and she'll leave the company. So not only are we not able to find new people, but we're losing the people that we have. Of course, when she shows up at her next job opportunity, she'll be hiking her salary and getting it because she's such a scarce commodity. So your security team is overwhelmed. Also, many companies do not have a 21 shift operation. That is three eight hour shifts per day, seven days a week or 24 by seven coverage. So at night, they don't really have anybody helping maintain the vigilance. 
all that's there is the software that they use, the firewall, the intrusion prevention systems, the authentication systems, you know, whatever they've put in place, that's it. No people to respond if an unusual attack takes place. That is another limitation that's telling you that if you're a mid-sized company or smaller, and even if you're a large corporation, it's very few corporations in the world, a handful, that can afford to have all these highly skilled, very expensive people doing something that has nothing to do with the primary business. Which brings us back to the cloud. So why did you transition to the cloud in the first place? Because network management is not what you do for a living. Similarly, security should not be what you do for a living. What you really want to turn to is a specific kind of cloud service called managed detection and response. Managed detection and response, MDR. And some of you may be saying, well, I'm using security from the cloud. And indeed, there are cloud-sourced firewalls. There are cloud-sourced security services. But basically, the shift there is that the, the, the software is being run elsewhere. MDR is a much larger, much more um, wide scope of services brought together to protect you more effectively, more efficiently than ever before. So what exactly is managed detection and response? Okay, well, let's first look at security as users expect it. This will help us to define the improvement that MDR creates. There are really three steps in providing security coverage. First step is to detect a problem. Now, most software will detect a problem when it hits your network. That's kind of too late. Uh, then once you've detected it, you have to investigate it. And whatever software you're running, hopefully it can figure that out. You may not have people on staff who can look at the data and figure out what's really going wrong. Well, you have to detect those problems as early as possible. And it is possible to detect them before they get to your network. You need to investigate them to determine the best way to remediate them. And sometimes that goes beyond what software can do by itself. And finally, you need to respond, if it was up to the users, you would respond an instant after they noticed there was a problem. If God forbid they were locked out of something. A second later, they want to be back into it. You know as well as I do how impatient users can be. And rightly so, they want to get their work done. Okay, that's the expectation users have. Fair. If you decide to do it yourself, same pattern, you're running software to monitor your incoming network traffic. And hopefully it catches it early when it first reaches your network. Then it has some time to interrogate it. And again, it's the software doing the interrogation. And based on the output from that technology, you hope to take an action. If that action doesn't work, you go into a cycle of trial and error. You try to figure out what can we do to stop this? How can we correct this? What caused this? And, and you get lost in that sauce. So um, that's difficult. And that's really the reason why you don't want to also be in the security business. You want to focus on your business. Good news. When you engage MDR to do it, again, it's the same pattern, okay? MDR, however, approaches this very differently. They start off with expert threat hunters. Can you picture Indiana Jones, you know, Indiana Tech Jones? Um, well, threat hunters are highly trained, very experienced humans, people, who are constantly monitoring your network with very powerful technology that they know how to operate and if you were to hire somebody to do that, they'd be very expensive for you. Um, they also are armed with third-party threat intelligence. 
That is to say, there are, there are now organizations that put out advisories every day about new threats that are occurring in the wild. Uh, they've seen this pattern. They've seen this kind of exploit. Uh, they've run into this kind of software download. And these experts are now well-informed. They know what to look for. So they're looking at the data. They're looking at the data before it reaches your network and identifying patterns that suggest that you're about to have some trouble. You're about to be attacked, um, compromised perhaps. So before that can ever happen, they're using the raw telemetry that is coming into them. And they're using software that gives them correlation capability, uh, enrichment of the data. They can perform root cause analysis, custom behavioral ana analysis. These are all things that, again, you can hire somebody to do that, but it would be prohibitively expensive. And you need more than one of them. Here you have whole teams of them. And yes, they're serving you and other customers. They're serving many customers who are sharing this cloud service, just like you share any other cloud service. But they have the expertise and the tools and the information to be able to handle these problems faster than anyone you've seen. So finally, when they respond, they're starting with automation to take care of the simple things. But then they have their own capabilities they have experience handling these kinds of problems from the many, many, many times they've done it before. And so they wrap their arms around the problem and solve it quickly. MDR can solve these problems quickly because they're better equipped and they're better staffed than you could possibly be without blowing your budget. So that being the case, the, the, the takeaway from today's presentation for me the bottom line is that there are very few companies that can afford the technology, the sophisticated tools we're talking about here, far more sophisticated than the commercial packages most of us use. Um, the intelligence report, reports are very expensive. Uh, and if you want to consume them, and you should if you're doing this work, you've got to pay for them, and they're very, very costly. But it's the people. It's the, the human resources that are tremendously expensive here. And you need a lot of them. If you're supporting everybody, you need several people to make sure that everybody is covered. And each of those people is tremendously expensive. MDR has basically done the same thing that the cloud did. Instead of running our own servers and storage, we use somebody else's server and storage. We share it with lots of other tenants which is the right financial model for them as well as us. We get lower cost and we get low, higher service. Now that shouldn't be the way things work, right? If you're getting better service, it should cost you more. Cloud changed that. Cloud, you get lower cost, better service. Well, with MDR, you can say the same thing about security. You'll get far better security and ultimately, it will cost you less than if you tried to do that yourself. And with that, I'll turn it back to John uh, to see if we have any questions about any of this. Thank you, sir. We do have a few. Um, let me uh, let me start here with this first one. Um, let's see, uh, Howard. How does MDR assume responsibility for my data? Since you were just talking about it. I'm sorry. Say that again, John. I apologize. How does uh, does MDR assume responsibility for my data? Oh, that's a, a really good question. And the I'm not going to yell into the microphone, but I wish I could. Um, that's a, a, a loud no. Uh, if you look at the contracts you get from cloud providers, including MDR providers, uh, it is spelled out in your agreement that they are not taking responsibility for your payload, for your data. Um, data always, always, always remains the fiduciary responsibility of the customer, of the user, uh, the user's company. Um, there are lots of good reasons for that uh, because there are many other ways that 
that data can be compromised that have nothing to do with the MDR company or the carrier or cloud providers. Um, but it's one of the reasons that we tell customers, no matter what else you do, be sure your data is encrypted, not only in transport from one place to the other, but also when it's at rest in storage. It must always be encrypted because then if somebody does compromise your data, they can't use it. It's it's completely you know scattered for them. So no, the 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 MDR provider, none of the cloud providers that I know of will take fiduciary responsibility for your data. Look at it this way. Um, who's going to lose their job if your data is compromised? And once you answer that question for yourself, you know where the responsibility lies. Thanks, Robert. So our second speaker uh, today, Laura Hamill, Principal Product Marketing Manager at Red Canary, um, had, wants to join the conversation a little early. Hi, Laura. Hi. Yeah, first off, I definitely agree with everything that you said. Um, but I will say that we are in charge of protecting the data that we analyze. And another good way to get more data protection is to have a cyber insurance provider. But yeah, your internal mm -hmm. team still owns the internal data. That's a good point. Okay, got another question for Howard. Um, where can I learn more about MDR uh, and what it can do for my company? Well, John, you just answered that question by introducing Laura. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> so, I, mean, I mean, seriously, the, the, the providers of MDR services are the best people to turn to, to learn more about them. Um, that's where I would go. Gotcha. Um, here's one. Um, let's see here. Can MDR be extended to our mobile devices? Um, yes. I mean, hmm, how do I explain this? That That's a, a great question. Um, but MDR is not necessarily device specific. Um, it's more about the overall network itself. You're protecting everything. And so, yes, there is endpoint protection included in that. And certainly mobile devices are endpoints. Uh, if MDR didn't have that, it, today, it would be becoming more and more useless. So yeah, I would say the, the answer is yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You know, I think we have time for one more question for Howard. Okay. Um, do you want to, I, I know you shy away from this a bit, but are, are, you, are there MDR products you would uh, recommend? Well, the, the answer actually is no such thing. There really aren't, hmm. and, and there aren't in existence MDR products. You know, MDR mm -hmm. is a cloud delivered service. It connects to your network and it protects your network for you. It's not like you can mm -hmm. go out and download a piece of software and run it yourself, mainly because it's the team, the people, the professionals um, that you really depend upon to augment the technology and augment the software and really provide that extra layer of protection that makes all the difference. So no, no products, um, just services.